So we're continuing on with our study in Genesis, Genesis chapter 29. This is where Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. So obviously that's not what he wanted to begin with, as we see in this chapter. And so uh, starting there in uh, verse 1, so as we know, he was journeying uh, and he was sent out by his father and his mother to go find a wife of his brethren. So uh, he's going to Paden Aaron or in Haran. So uh, a lot of times it's used those two different places. It's the same place, um, but uh, in uh, and a lot, or sometimes it's like more of a distinct place. So if you think about, I'm going to Morgantown, but specifically I'm going to Westover, you know, something kind of like that, you know, where there's like subsets of a city or a place. So uh, in verse one there, it says, then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. So where is he at? You know, obviously out to the east a little more. OK, so uh, and then in verse four, it tells us where he was, because the people, when he went to this well, he asked the people who they were of or where they're from. And in verse four, it says, and Jacob said unto them, my brethren, whence be ye? And they said of Haran, are we? And so this place, Haran, is, I believe, where Syria is at. Or it's, it's a province of Syria, because in Genesis 25, and just to kind of give you a, a little bit of backstory as far as what's Haran, why would his relatives even be there? Well, um, it's not where Abraham's originally from, but it's kind of like this uh, from where he came from to begin with to where they were at, sojourning for a little bit, and then he went the whole way uh, later on. But his brother Nahor stayed in Haran. So that's what we're going to see. But I just want you to see that. But I also want to prove to you that they're in Syria because Laban and his father Bethuel are called Syrians. Okay. And so in verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 20, it says, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to, to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian, a paid in Aram, a paid in Aram the sister to Laban the Syrian. Okay, so both... Bethuel, and if you remember, Bethuel was the son of Nahor, and obviously Laban is the son of Bethuel. So, and so Bethuel was Rebekah's father. So uh, that would be uh, Jacob's grandfather, and Laban would be his uncle. Okay, and so they're Syrians though, and they're a paid in Aram, and that's where he told them to go, and it's also called Haran. Now, just to give you back to you know. Why are they in Haran? We'll go to Genesis chapter 11. I know this is a review, but I just want you to see the geography of where they're at. So if you look on a modern day map, I believe Syria is the same place it was for back then. So if you look at where Syria is at now, that's where you're dealing with it. Um, so and if you think of Babylon as more like the Iraq, uh, uh, Iraq and like uh, and Persia is more like where Iran's at. So some of these places, you know, they, they still call them Persians, but you know what I mean? But their their country may be called something else. So, But in Genesis 11, verse 31, it says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son. So don't let that confuse you, because Haran is a person too. But they're also going to go to a place called Haran. <laughs> okay? So don't let that confuse you. Uh, but it says, And Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth from or uh, with them from Ur of the Chaldees. So where they, where was he originally from? Ur of the Chaldees. Now, the Chaldeans, what country were they of? Or where were the Chaldeans? What is that always, always synonymous with Babylon? So they came out of Babylon. That's where, that's where Abraham's family's from. But then they went to Syria before they came into Canaan. And so I just want you to see a little bit of that as far as that goes. And it, it says... Um, uh, or the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. So that's what their mission was, was to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So they didn't make it all the way. And it says in verse 32, And the days of Terah were 250, or 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So in Acts, I'm not going to go there for sake of time, but in Acts chapter 7, it talks about after his father died, he went into Canaan. Okay, and in, ver in chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So when his father died, 
He was 75 years old and he left Haran. But Nahor stayed. Notice who went with him, Lot. And Lot's dad had already died. Haran had already died. And so uh, Haran died before they even went to Haran. Okay, so I don't believe that Haran had anything to do with Haran. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, a lot of times they name a place after somebody. I don't believe it's after Terah's son Haran. Okay, it's just a popular name, or maybe they named it because of that place. I don't know. But, uh, but all that to say is that why is he going to Haran? Why is he going to Paden Aram? Because that's where Nahor stayed. So Nahor stayed there, so all his people are there, and that's where Rebecca, Rebecca came from Nahor, and so the servant went and, and went to the same place, and Jacob's doing the same journey, only he's going himself instead of Isaac going. And so, um, and also, Isaac didn't have to work for his wives. So you can see that the, Jacob's definitely uh, not getting the same blessing that Isaac got. And we can see him reaping what he's sowing in this chapter, obviously. Um, but, but that's a big difference between how that worked. I mean, Isaac just was at home. He didn't have to go find his wife. Someone got his wife for him, brought him back, and he didn't have to pay at all. <laughs> so, um, but, so I just want you to see that. Where are they at? They're at Haran. It's where Syria is at now, if you want to look at a map as far as where they're at. So he's not in, you know in Canaan or where Israel would be, but he's outside of that to go find his wife. So, uh, but in, in, in verse 2 there, he goes, comes to this well in the field. It says in verse 2, And he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. So what you see here is that there's this well, but they have a stone that's rolled on top of it to where you can't get into it. And so maybe they're just keeping stuff away from it, keeping animals out of it. I don't know exactly why, but, um, but they, they, they roll the stone on it when they're not using it, it looks like. And... Uh, and so anyway, uh, it looks like, and we'll see later on uh, as we read on, that all the, all the shepherds pretty much have to come together at one time and roll this stone off this well, okay? Because that's what they're saying, all the flocks are gathered. Thither were all the flocks gathered. So at this time, at this point, there's three flocks there, but it doesn't look like all of them are there yet. And so uh, that's going to be important when we see what Jacob does, okay? <laughs> because in verse 5, notice what it says. In verse 5, it says, And he said unto them, Know ye Laban the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel his daughter cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together, Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. So he's telling them, you know, why aren't you watering the sheep? You know, and, and so uh, it, it's, it's high day. Why aren't you watering them, right? So, and then in verse 8, they give the reason why. It says, and they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth then we water the sheep. Notice they roll the stone from the well's mouth. So it's a multitude of people that are rolling the stone. So this thing must have been pretty heavy. And so basically they're waiting. They're there. they, there's three flocks that are already there. They're waiting to water their sheep and they can't roll the stone away yet. And he's basically asking them who they are. And then he asks about uh, Laban to see if he's well, you know, and all this stuff. And as he asks that, I guess uh, uh, what they're saying is that Rachel is approaching unto the well with his sheep. And so um, that's what he sees. Now that's what we're going to get to here in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Now notice what happens here. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So what do you have here? They just had a whole discussion on why they can't 
water the flocks because they have to wait until all the flocks get there and then they roll the stone away. But, but Jacob, imagine this, it's basically he's showing off <laughs> For Rachel. Now, this is where you know a lot of I've heard a lot of preachers talk about Jacob and be like, "Oh, Esau is the tough guy, and Jacob is this weakling. Like he's just this kind of scrawny guy, and and it's 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 like this typical like um, reason to not want to be strong or something like that. And it, and for some reason in Baptist churches, it's it's it, you know it's a it's a glory to. To, to be fat and be lazy and all this other stuff or it's a glory not to be strong no I mean obviously what's more important you know God godliness is more important than bodily exercise but you know having physical strength it says uh, the glory of young men is their strength and so there, there's there's something to be said about having strength, just physical strength. David had physical physical strength. Jacob had physical strength, and so uh, he's showing that off. Okay, and so obviously, ladies, you know, you want a you want a guy that's spiritually strong. That's first and foremost, right? But I don't think most of the ladies. I mean, I've heard I've, I remember girls telling me they don't like muscular guys, but I'm like, you're just lying to me. That's what I'm. That's all I can think of. Or they don't like guys that are strong or something like that. They like little weak guys. I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think that's the case. And I'm not saying you need to be a bodybuilder. You know, that's not strength. I, I know people that that don't look like bodybuilders at all that are extremely strong. You know, that that dad strength, right? <laughs> or that that farmer strength. And you look at him and you say, that guy's not that strong. And then he can like just bend a bar with his, with his bare hands. Or he can throw a hay bale over top of a, you know, into a barn or something like that. And so I'm not saying you got to look strong. But there's a difference between looking strong and being strong. Same thing with women. Remember in uh, the book of Proverbs in, in chapter 31, it talks about her strengthening her arms. And strengthening her loins. And so um, you can think about, I mean, carrying children and doing all that stuff. I mean, Holly has a baby in her arms at all times. I'm like holding one and I'm like, I, I'm tired, you know, like it. And I go to the gym, you know, but it's just one of those things where you get stronger, your arms get stronger, even doing like, like sewing, knitting, all that stuff. I mean, there, there's a thing that just takes strength into your arms. Whereas if I tried to do it, I would literally be like, I can't move my hands because it's one of those things that you, you learn strengths and, and, and sometimes it's not always like you know your you know like your bench press or something like that and so there, there's a lot to be said about strength in, in our lives and so uh, don't throw that out you know you want to find something and it's it's good for your health as well okay uh, you're gonna feel better if, if, if you're if you're in shape or you're, you're, you're stronger um, and so it, I wouldn't lift if I didn't want to be strong you know uh, but don't take that too far, okay? I'm not saying that we need to go crazy with it and just go overboard to where that's all you do, that's all you think about and all that stuff. I think it just needs to be there. You need to be saying, hey, I need to be strong, and, and especially men, uh, because we're to be the protectors. And if you think about it, uh, especially back then, or not even that far back, I mean, just back in the day when, when men were the, protect, were the protectors, right? We're the ones that are supposed to protect the women and the children. And, you know, I think girls like that. I think my wife you know, would like the fact that I wouldn't, if someone came up to him, she wouldn't be the strongest one in the group. That's all I'm saying, okay? If your wife is stronger than you, you need to get some strength. You need to go to the gym, okay? And uh, I'm not the strongest guy in the world, but I guarantee you I could beat any girl in arm wrestling right now in this, in this auditorium. Or, I, you know, I, I would even challenge any girl that's in the gym uh, just because men are stronger and women are weaker vessels. But Jacob's kind of showing that off, right? He's almost kind of like, you know, he, you know, he just imagine, you know, she's coming up here like, I got this baby. And just rolls the stone over, right? And, you know, everybody else is probably looking at it like, what in the world just happened? And so, uh, I could see this, you know, you know, especially when you're younger and you're just trying to impress a girl. And so, I don't know if later on he's like, He's like, you know, crying inside, and <laughs> like his back really hurts from rolling the stone over. But, uh, but no, I, I, I think that maybe just the pure adrenaline of seeing Rachel, 
and and I can see this you know like you just you're so happy you see her she you know it's like love at first sight that's what I see with this with with Rachel is that he sees Rachel and it's like that's the one you know I want her and he just like has this adrenaline in him to where he just like rolls the stone over him so um, but that puts that out the window that he's a weakling right they just made this whole point about how all the flocks had to be there and there was at least three there already so that means three guys didn't think it, they had enough in them to roll that stone over and he did it by himself so uh, anyway I think that's a cool story every time I read that that's what I think about it him showing off the Rachel is just be like I got this you know and, and just rolls the stone over um, but notice in verse 11 that he meets uh, he meets with uh, or he, he meets Rachel here. It says in verse eleven, it says, "And Jacob kissed Rachel, and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother, and that he was uh, Rebecca's son. And she ran and told her father. So when he kisses her, I don't believe this is like a romantic kiss, like you'd see in a movie or something like that. He just like goes up and just kisses her, like like." Prince Charming or something like that. I believe this is just a greeting, okay? Um, because in the next uh, verse, Laban kisses him. So let's hope that that's not a romantic kiss there, okay? So I believe it's a greeting, okay? So don't don't get in here and be like, well, this is okay for me to kiss my, you know, like ladies uh, or men to kiss your girlfriends. And, you know, like, it's good that a man not touch a woman, you know, before you're married. Um, I'm not going to tell you that kissing is a sin, but I'll say this, you know, that if you don't kiss, then other things aren't going to happen, okay? So it's better just to, to stay away from that kind of contact and all that stuff. Um, obviously, kissing them on the cheek isn't wrong because the Bible says, actually, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. This isn't the only place it's mentioned, but... There, there's a lot of there's places in the New Testament where it talks about greeting somebody with a, a kiss of charity. Okay, and so this isn't our custom here, so don't start kissing me on the cheek. Okay, so uh, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just that that's that would be strange, right? Uh, but there's cultures that have that custom where you kiss them on the cheek, and it's nothing. There's nothing nefarious about it. There's nothing queer about it. It's just how you greet somebody. Um, but in the, uh, the last verse of First Peter, so this is the send-off. It says in verse 14, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so obviously their custom there was to, to greet someone with a kiss. Okay? And obviously I believe it was on the cheek. Okay? Um, on the lips would be a little weird. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, we're not starting that custom here, by the way. But all that to say is that I believe that's what that's talking about, is greeting someone with a kiss of charity. And so just as much as brethren, you know, with Peter is telling brethren to do that, I don't believe, I, that's what I believe is happening here, okay? Um, so uh, he kisses her and then he weeps. So I don't know if he was just like bawling like a little girl. <laughs> I don't think so, right? Uh, I think it was more just like tears of joy. Um, you know, that he had found her, that he found Laban's daughter. Um, but again, in verse 13, Laban comes out and embraces him and kisses him. So in verse 13, it says, And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. So obviously we see that this is, you know, just a, a kiss of charity. So it's not something romantic. Um, but again, even if it was, just because Jacob did it doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> okay. Um, but I just think that that's probably what it was. I don't think there was anything bad about it. Um, he was just happy to, to see her, to meet her, and, um, and, and he kissed her. So, uh, but, but notice here uh, that when Jacob comes to Laban's house, He's telling them all things, so he's just telling them everything that's going on. He actually stays with them for a month and is working for him for free. And so something I never really noticed, I was actually listening to Pastor Jimenez's sermon on when he ordained uh, Pastor uh, Aaron Thompson now. 
uh, and he was kind of pointing this out, and I was like, oh, this is perfect. He was like preaching through uh, some stuff in Genesis. I'm like, I'm preaching on that. I don't even have to study it now. No, <laughs> but uh, no, he was like bringing up some points, and and this is one he was kind of mentioning because he was talking about how Jacob was a shepherd, and we haven't got to that yet, but how Jacob's a shepherd, and he actually worked for free for a month before he even got paid any wages. And, uh, and he was kind of talking about how Aaron Thompson, uh, brother Aaron, Aaron Thompson, didn't get paid for those two years that he was, pa that he was basically the preacher there at uh, Verity Vancouver, which is now Sure Foundation Baptist Church in Vancouver, Washington. And uh, he was kind of just making a point with that, you know, the fact that uh, he didn't take a wage and he was just a good worker and, and stuff like that. So, but anyway, it says in verse 14, it says, And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of, space of a month. I never really noticed that, that, you know, that there was this space of a month that was going on because that really helps you understand why he says this in verse 15. Verse 15, it says, And Laban said unto Jacob, because thou art my, my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? So that makes a lot of sense, right? It's not like he just meets him and says, you're my bone and my flesh, what's your wages going to be? He's like, I just got here, what are you talking about, right? Um, I didn't say I was going to work for you. <laughs> no. But uh, no, he was living with them, and so he was just working for them. And it's kind of like for room and board, so to speak. He was just working for him, right? And, and Laban saying, listen, you're my brother. You know, what do, what do, what's your wage is going to be? You're not like a you know, slave to me here. And so that he's basically wanting to pay him. And one thing I want to point out here first, too, uh, is the fact that Laban is calling Jacob his brother. But what is Laban? His uncle. And actually, it's mentioned other times that it's Jacob's, uh, you know, his sister's son. So it's very clear that Laban is his uncle, but he calls him brother. Now this is important because uh, certain things like this will help you decipher so-called contradictions in the Bible. I want to show you one, and I'm going to show you how this completely makes sense. When you, when you know this story here, and know that, hey, Laban and Jacob are calling each other brothers, even though one's an uncle and one's a nephew, uh, go to 2 Kings chapter 24, 2 Kings chapter 24. There's actually a couple things in this chapter I'm going to show you that, that helps you decipher some harder passages. Or, you know, like in this case, it's a so-called contradiction. Um, I remember one time, I, I think, I, I don't know if it, I don't think I saw this one just through reading. I think I just, I was just curious on what people thought were contradictions in the Bible. So I just went to like some atheist site and they had like a whole list of like, contradictions in the Bible. And I was just like, all right, let's see what they got, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I was going through them and most of them are really, really, you just throw out. You're just like, they don't understand grammar. They're looking at another version. And so like a lot of them are just like, just off the cuff. These are stupid, right? But then there's other ones where it's like the co-regency thing with, with the one place it says he reigned this many years, this place it says he reigned this many years. And it's just the simple fact that he was reigning while his father was still alive and reigning. And then in one passage, uh, it's just mentioning how long he reigned when it was just him. Okay, And so there's easy ways to answer a lot of those. But this was one of them. This is one of them that uh, they brought up. And it says in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 24 and verse 17, and just to give you a little backstory so we don't have to read this whole passage, what happens here is that Jehoiakim dies and his son Jehoiakim reigns in Judah for three months, he's taken captive, and then Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar sets up Zedekiah. So if you know the story, Jehoiakim is the, the one that Jeremiah is preaching to, saying, hey, Nebuchadnezzar's gonna come, all this stuff, right? And he finally does, and then when Nebuchadnezzar comes in, his son takes over for him after he dies for three months, but then he's taken captive, taken into Babylon, and Zedekiah is set up as king, and he, he reigns for 11 years until he rebels against, Zedek, against Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? So all I have to say is Zedekiah is Jehoiakim's brother. Okay? So, but we're going to see how they get confused here. And so Jehoiakim has a brother named Zedekiah, and Jehoiakim has a son named Jehoiakim. 
Okay, and I know it's confusing, so bear with me. But in 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 17, it says, And the king of Babylon made Mattaniah his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. So he's, he's talking about Zec, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim's son. He's saying that he made Mattaniah his father's brother. So who's that? His uncle. And he renamed him Zedekiah. Okay? So what happened? You know, he, he was reigning for like three months, and he's like, no, you're taking the battle on. I'm setting up your uncle to be king. And but go to Second Chronicles. Where, here's where it gets, it gets tricky. So-called, right? Because in this passage, it's clear that it's Jehoiakim's uncle, right? Well, in, uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 9, and if you know that 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, these are parallel passages. So it's describing the same event. So that's where they get these so-called contradictions because you're looking at two different tellings of the same story and they're looking for discrepancies, okay? But in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 9, it says, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. Okay, so he's a, he's a youngster, okay, and he's reigning only for three months, and he was basically just, you know, it's almost like he was set up as king by his father or by the people there, and then Nebuchadnezzar's like, no, I'm putting your uncle in charge, and he t sends him to Babylon. Actually, Jehoiakim is going to be raised up later on when he's in captivity, so, uh, but anyway, it, it keep going there. It says, and, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and it says, and when the year was expired... King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. So in this passage it says it's, it's Jehoiakim's brother. In the other passage it says it's his father's brother. So you can see how people say, well, that's a contradiction. One place it says it's his brother, another place it says it's his uncle. Well, it's not a contradiction when you understand that brother can actually mean your uncle. Because in Genesis chapter 29, we saw here that Laban is calling Jacob his brother and Jacob's going to call him his brother. So they're going back and forth saying that, but they know that they're not like brothers like, like me and my brother are, right? And so it's just a term that the Bible's defining brother there. You know, it, it, it's your dad's brother. And so it, obviously the Bible's defining brother. Can, brother can mean an uncle. And it probably would also translate to that if you had an aunt, that would be your sister. Okay? And so the, the Bible terminology is very clear on this, so there's no contradiction. It's just Bible terminology and how it uses the word brother. And brethren sometimes doesn't mean brother, sister, or whatever. It can also mean cousins and, and just relatives and kin. Okay? And so, uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted you to see that that so-called contradiction there, um, which is not really a contradiction. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, but that's why Gen Genesis has a lot of definitions. Think of the word repent. It's a great definition of the word repent. There's a great, I mean, there's a lot of first mentions in the book of Genesis. Think of fruit. You know, people have a hard time understanding what fruit means in the New Testament. And if they just made it to Genesis 1, they know what we're talking about there. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that is just first mentioned. Genesis is obviously going to be first mention of anything, right? Because if there's anything in Genesis, that's the first time because it's the first book. And so it's good to go through Genesis and know Genesis because it's going to help you be equipped for these other passages. And when people throw out that type of stuff, okay? And you may never have been hung up on it. You're like, yeah, I knew that, or it's not a big deal. But, um, but I have seen people say that type of stuff. So, but going back to Genesis chapter 29, or 29 and verse 16. So uh, Laban is asking Jacob, what are your wages going to be? Well, what's his answer? It says in verse 16, and Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, tender -eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So that's his wages. He says, I want your daughter. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so he had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And Leah was tender-eyed, tender -eyed, and Rachel was beautiful. So... Um, 
I think tender-eyed is like the nice way of saying she wasn't that beautiful, I guess. Um, but uh, so obviously Jacob's looking on the outward appearance. I'm sure that, I mean, if you think about it, when Rachel came up to water her flock, what else could he see besides her appearance? Um, but, uh, but Leah, what we'll see, and we're not really going to get into too much, Leah uh, was actually, to what I could see, is probably the more godly wife. Okay, and so uh, where, where you have beauty, a lot of times you have vanity. And, and you know, that's something that we need to kind of try to look past. Now, I'm not saying that not to be attracted to, to the person that you marry, but there's a lot of truth to be said about that. You know, trying to find the most handsome looking guy, ladies. You know, there's a lot of vanity in that. There's a lot of pride and arrogancy when people are very good looking. And same thing with men when you're looking for a, for a lady. Uh, you know, when, they, when they're extremely beautiful or like a supermodel, a lot of times the reason they look like a supermodel is because they did a lot of work to make themselves look that way. Or they spend a lot of time in the mirror to make themselves look that way. And so uh, when you're, you need to be looking for godliness, okay? And I don't think, it doesn't say Le, uh, Leah was like, look like a goat or anything like that. I don't think that that's what we're dealing with here, okay? I think when you compare them, though, I think what they're doing is comparing the two. And here's the thing. Jacob's going to be tricked by Laban to marry Leah. That means they had to be pretty similar in the, their physique, okay? To be tricked like that. I mean, she couldn't have been a heifer. And then, like, Rachel's like this really skinny rail, okay? And all I'm saying with that is that I don't think that she was really ugly or something like that. I think she was just not as pretty as Rachel, okay? Rachel was like the one that was pretty and all this stuff. But you know what? A lot of times, those that aren't as pretty or aren't that handsome end up making up for it in their personality and end up making up for it in uh, their humility. Because people that have everything, and I've preached on this before, you know, when I, when I grew up in, in, uh, in middle school and high school, I was always the shortest person. I couldn't play sports. I could only wrestle because, you know, there was weight classes and actually being short was an advantage because you're low, low center of gravity, you know. Um, and that type of stuff, though, going through that and, and not having that, that high regard from everyone around you helps keep you humble, right? It's hard to be arrogant when not everybody like you know, when, when the girls don't all like you or you're not the most popular person in school and all this stuff. And if you imagine, Leah probably grew up that way. Rachel's always the pretty one, and which would make her more humble. And uh, we'll see a story with Rachel. I don't want to you know, get into it, but we'll see a, a story with Rachel that she was not the most godly one. Okay? And so, but here's the thing. Uh, I... <laughs> We need to not be looking at appearance when we're looking for a spouse or just looking at anybody for that matter. Uh, it's what's in the heart. And so, but he's going to be tricked here. And uh, in, in, verse, uh, in verse 18 it says, I will serve seven years for Rachel. And Laban doesn't, just, doesn't say anything about the fact that he just kind of goes with it. Okay, because if he would have said, I mean, imagine that, that Jacob would have been on guard a little bit if he's like, well, I don't really want to give you Rachel. I want to give you Leah because she's the oldest. And so he doesn't say anything. So Laban's very smart about this. He, if he's going to trick him, he's just going to go along and think that everything is just the way it's supposed to be. And uh, in verse 19, it says, And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for, that, for the love he had to her. So that always strikes me right there where, where it says that they were about a few days. Seven years. That's not a short period of time. And what I see with this is, especially with the, young, with you, uh, with the younger crowd, is the fact that waiting to be married, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said about that as far as the fact that 
it's not that long. It seems long, okay? When you're younger or you're, you know, you're wanting to get married and you're just like, this is taking forever. I want to be married now. Uh, you know, think about Jacob. He, he worked for seven years knowing who his wife was going to be and she was there and he was obviously of age to where he could marry her. And so, but to him, he loved her so much that he didn't mind waiting seven years and to him that was but a few days. You know what that shows me is that someone that'll wait actually loves you a lot more. Okay, and go to go to Hebrews chapter uh, chapter eleven. I'm not going to park it here too much, but the Bible talks a, a lot about fleeing fornication, the the concupiscence or the evil concupiscence of the flesh, all that stuff. As far as that physical relationship between a man and a woman happening outside of marriage we need to you need to flee that but you need to you need to be looking at the future you need to be thinking about the future and that's what I see with Jacob is that he was working these seven years but he was looking at the prize he was looking at like the goal and to him he knew that was he knew it was gonna happen he just had to he worked through it it's gonna happen all that stuff and to him it was but a, but a few days but if you're just dwelling on it do you see, you see, when you look ahead, it's kind of like if you ever run before. Okay, I don't like running, but I do run. Okay, and it's better when you look further ahead than when you look closer, because when you're looking closer, you're just like, ah, oh, you know, like you're just thinking about how you're not there. But if you look ahead, you can kind of just keep that eye on the prize, not think about it. You know, with running. I just have to not think about it. When I, a lot of times I'll run throughout the week and it's just me running. Or, uh, But on Fridays, Dave will lift with me, Dave Gandy. And uh, we'll run and we're always just like, why is it so much easier to run when we're running together? Because we're always talking. <laughs> okay, so, and we're talking, which is ridiculous too, because you know, I'm not a good runner, so I'm always just trying to breathe. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but when we run together, why is it? Because we're not thinking about it. We're talking about some false doctrine, some out there. We're talking about whatever, gossiping. No, uh, no we're, we're usually just talking to each other, catching up, whatever, just talking about different things. But before we know it, we're done. I'm not even winded. And you're just like, wait, what in the world? I was talking and I'm not winded. I'm, I'm usually when I'm running, I'm running a shorter distance by myself and I'm winded and I'm not talking, okay? Anybody knows if you're running, it's hard to talk, right? Because you're, getting, you're, you're just wanting to breathe. And so why is that? Because you're not thinking about it. You're not dwelling on it. So Jacob wasn't just like, I want her now. I want her now. I want her now. Does that make sense? I want this now. He was thinking more in the future and not on the momentary state. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, I think about this when I think about fornication. or just, Obviously, this is sin in general. Okay. But think about it, the, the heart of Moses. Okay. And, and verse 24. So Hebrews 11 verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the re reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the re recompense of the reward. Now, obviously, this is what we think about in the Christian life, right? We, we're supposed to be focused on things that are eternal, not on things that are temporal. And not on sin that's, that's a momentary pleasure. We need to be thinking about the pleasures that will be in eternity and keep our focus on eternity. And when it comes to fornication, I see that because fornication is just a pleasure, pleasure for the season. And sin will always take you further than when you want to go and make you pay more than you want to pay. And so it's not going to be worth it. And it's only for a moment. It's only for a short time. And marriage is for life. So you have your whole life to enjoy uh, being married and, and, and you know, all that stuff with your spouse. But you need, to, you need to flee fornication and have that heart of Jacob where he, did, he loved her and it was just but a few days to him, even though it was seven years. And so uh, you may say, well, I, mean, I didn't get married until I was 29. I'm not recommending that. Okay? But all I'm saying is that uh, you know, don't, don't lose hope you know, if you're looking for a spouse or anything like that. Um, you know, find the right one. 
because you're going to be married to him for the rest of your life. I mean, that's the, that's the plan, right? And so you need to have that in your mind that, you know, we're going to be together for, for, for life. And, you know, just think about that. So don't make some rash decision. I'm mean, just going to get married to get married. Okay. Now, obviously, you know, it's better to, it's better to get married than to, to, you know, commit fornication. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you have the opportunity, you have the choice and all that stuff, you want to make the right choice and find the right person uh, to marry. So, but uh, going back to Genesis chapter 29, that's what I see with when I see that. I see that he really did love Rachel. And he wasn't, he wasn't just focused on, on, on that physical act. He was, he was focused on he wanted her to be his wife. And he was looking into the, the future. He was looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. And it was snatched away from him <laughs> later on here. Uh, but in, uh, in, in chapter 29, verse 21, Laban is going to supplant Jacob. So if you remember what happened in chapter 27, Jacob supplants his brother Esau and steals his blessing. And it's coming around. And this is what we see. So he's, not, he's first of all, having to work for his wife which Isaac didn't have to do. And now he's going to be beguiled into marrying the wrong daughter. And so in verse 21, it says, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. I think that that's the key to understand what's probably going on here. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him and he went in unto her. So this is why I think that they're very similar. It's kind of like Jacob and Esau. I don't think that there's that they were both probably strong guys because for, for Isaac to come up to him and like hug him and embrace him and hold him and stuff like that, he couldn't have been this rail and then you got Esau who's like this this beast, right? Now obviously he was hairy, that was the big thing but I think that's the pretty main, big main difference between them. One's hairy, one's not. And, but the, the physique is the same. And for this to work out, I'd, I'd say that, you know, they're, they're probably the same physique, all this stuff. And I don't think Leah was horribly deformed or anything like that. Or she was like, yeah, I, I, I think people do that though. When they say, when you look at one and they're like, she was fair, they look at the other one and be like, well, she was just ugly, you know? I don't think that's the case. I think she was just, you know, a normal looking girl. And, and Rachel was just, you know, supermodel status I don't know but uh, but she was definitely everybody else thought she was prettier but that's but the, the, why, how did this happen you know that's the big question how in the world did this happen <laughs> and so um, but it says in verse 24 just to read on just see what happens here it says and Laban gave unto his daughter uh, or his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid for an handmaid and it came to pass that in the morning behold it was Leah and he said to Laban what is this thou hast done unto me did not I serve with thee for Rachel wherefore then hast thou beguiled me and Laban said it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn so now he comes out and says it um, but uh, so we see that he's reaping what he's sown but how did this happen? Well, it says that he made a feast. Now, it doesn't say that they had alcohol there, but I have a feeling they did. Okay? Because especially if you've been working with Laban for seven years, you're going to know who these girls are. Right? It's not like, I, I don't think that he kept them away from them. You know, I'm sure he probably was around them, talked to them, all this other stuff. So I have a feeling that, you know, this is just my opinion on this. I believe there was alcohol involved and he was, you know, probably drunk. I don't know. But to the point where his senses weren't all there. But uh, you don't have to turn over to Proverbs 20, verse 1. It says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know, wine, wine is just, it, it, you're not sober, you're not in your right mind, and you make poor decisions. You're not just, you're, you're, just, you're not in a good state of mind when you're, when you're drinking. But in Proverbs 23, it says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to mix, or seek mixed wine, 
And in verse 33 of Proverbs 23, it says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So when you're, when you're under the influence, you tend to do things that you wouldn't want to do, or you don't really know what's going on. And so, I, to me, that's probably what happened. You know, it's always strange. I, it's still strange to me that, 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 that he didn't know that it was Leah and not Rachel. But obviously he was beguiled. And he's reaping what he's doing. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Now, people always say what comes around goes around, or what goes around comes around. Yeah. Wait, get that backwards. Uh, what goes around comes around. They're always like talking about karma. Well, the Bible doesn't talk about karma. That's like Hindu or Buddhist garbage, okay? Uh, the Bible talks about reaping what you've sown. Okay, and we see that Jacob is reaping what he sown. What did he sow? Deceiving his father and his brother, and you know, stealing something from from him. And Galatians six and verse seven, it says, "Be not deceived; God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting." So. Obviously, we, we have our flesh and we have our spirit. And what you sow, are you going to sow in your flesh? Or are you going to sow in your spirit? And obviously, this is liking this on the soul winning, I believe, talking about reaping life everlasting. Because when you win someone to Christ, what are you doing? You're reaping life everlasting because they're getting the gift of eternal life. And so we're obviously supposed to labor and faint not uh, and all that uh, talking about soul winning. But if you, if you sow in the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. And that's what Jacob did. And so that's what we need to remember, you know, what consequences for our actions as children of God. That this is telling us this, that God's not mocked for whatsoever man so is, that shall he also reap. I use this all the time out soul winning after I explain eternal security and say you can never lose your salvation. But know this, that if you sow in the flesh, you're going to reap corruption in the flesh. So we still have consequences in this life in the flesh. And so don't think that you just have a get out of jail free card when it comes to just all consequences in life here. Now, obviously, you get a get out of jail free card when it comes to hell. Yeah, that is faith alone, not by works at all. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. But when it comes to our walk in this life, in our flesh, our flesh isn't regenerated. Our flesh is the old man. Our flesh still has the curse of the law on it. And we will suffer the consequences. But this is a classic example of reaping what you've sown. This happens to David. Remember when David commits adultery and then has Uriah killed? Doesn't he have a lot of reaping that happens after that of what he's sown? From losing the child to losing his kingdom to his other son. His son killing his one son. You know, think about it. his one son rapes his half sister, his half daughter, or his daughter, and then then that his one son kills that son and then his that son tries to take over his kingdom and then he dies and so there's a lot of reaping that happens to david because of what he did and so we need to remember that as christians that god is not mocked you know don't think that you're going to get away with that type of stuff now god is merciful but he will not at all acquit the wicked you know the bible is very clear on the fact that you know, we're going to reap what, we sow, what we've sown, and we need to re remember that. So, but going back to Genesis chapter 29 and verse 27, here's an interesting thing that's going on here. Um, because he's obviously going to end up uh, marrying Rachel as well. But look at uh, verse 27 here. Because it, it says in verse 27, Fulfill her week. And we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And it says, And Jacob did so, and fulfilled her week. And he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Now what's interesting about this passage is it talks about fulfilling her week. And there's two ways to look at this, okay? Is that this is a physical seven-day week, and then he's talking about Leah, saying, like, you married Leah, you know, at least be with her for a week before you marry Rachel. 
and then served me for seven other years for Rachel. And so those are two separate things, or the week is referring to the seven years. I'm going to show you, obviously, Daniel chapter 9, I'm going to show you that where those weeks are definitely years, like seven years, period. So week would be more so a term that can mean a, a, a multitude, or seven. You know, it could be a week of months, or a week of days, or a week of years. And so, uh, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm kind of torn with where I'm at on this because of what's said later. So, at first it seems like he's saying, fulfill her week, I'll give you Rachel. And basically, like, he marries Leah after he worked for seven years. Then he works another seven years, and then he marries Rachel. That's what it kind of sounds like at first, right? And it says in verse uh, 28, it says, And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also. So that's kind of what it sounds like, right? If the week is the seven years, he worked for another seven years, and then he got Rachel. But then, notice what it says in verse 29. It says, And Laban gave to, or I'm sorry, in verse 30, it says, And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. So now it looks like he got Rachel before he served those seven other years. Now, unless this seven other years is talking about how he's going to work for him after that, because he does work for him for another, actually, six years. He works 20 total years for Laban before he hits the road, okay? But to me, I think you could take it either way. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% positive on this um, as far as the week being days. Like, just, It depends on whether the week is talking about Leah or if it's talking about Rachel. And to me, it almost looks like it's a week of days and that he fulfills the week with Leah and then he gives him Rachel or before he does the seven-year work. So he gets Rachel, but then it's kind of like a he's reimbursing kind of deal. That's the way it kind of reads, especially when you look at verse 30. Because you could say that that seven, I guess the, the reason that I think that that's the case is because it says, and he served with him yet seven other years. And that's exactly what he says in verse 27. It says, thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So to me, that's what it looks like. It looks like he marries Leah, and instead of like giving him Rachel that day, you know, right after he married Leah, basically there's like a week where they're together, honeymoon, I don't know. Uh, and then r after that week, Rachel's given to him, and then he works another seven years for her, kind of like back payment. So that's the way it reads to me, just the way I'm looking at it. I used to take it as the week was seven years. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't see it that way. I, to me, I think the fulfill her week is talking about Leah. The her is talking about Leah. More so because I just think it would be weird to like, the way it reads, that, that's, verse 30 is, is, is the smoking gun to me with that. You're probably like, I don't care. But that's, I, I'm just saying like, when I read this, I'm always trying to figure out how like the timeline of it goes. Did he get Rachel after 14 years of being there, or did he get Rachel after seven years, and then he worked that other seven years for her? I think that's the way it, that's the way it looks like it reads. He went in unto, uh, also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. So it sounds like the serving the seven other years happens after he already went in unto Rachel. So anyway, but I do want to show you, go to Daniel chapter 9. You know that weeks can be talking about years so that's where i would say you know there, there's a chance that it, it, it's talking about the fact that um that it's years but in that case you know when he says he fulfilled her week he's talking about the seven years for rachel so that means he worked another seven years before he got rachel so I don't know if he could definitively prove otherwise, but I think verse 30 is kind of really showing that, that he got Rachel before he worked that seven years. Just personally, that's the way, the way I see it. And in verse 28, it says he fulfilled her week before he got Rachel. So to me, that's kind of how that works out. The fulfilling her week came before Rachel and the working seven other years came after Rachel. So this kind of separates those a little bit. 
I don't think it really makes that much difference. <laughs> but, uh, but all that to say is that's what I, I kind of see there. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, this is a famous end times prophecy. This really gives you a lot of timeline uh, aspects of end times. But in verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to set up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now what I want you to see there is that, you know, whether this is, a, I, I talked about this in the age of the earth, that this is probably the commandment to go rebuild the wall with Nehemiah and not the temple. Uh, because it's talking about rebuilding Jerusalem. And in troublous times, and obviously with Nehemiah, there was troublous times. They had to like have a sword, and and they, they worked with one hand, and they had the sword in the other hand, right? Um, that this is clearly years. Like, there's no way to get around this. I mean, we, we it's already happened. From Messiah being cut off, what's that? Christ being crucified. So we know this is clearly years, and I was kind of showing you how that all fit. You know, if that commandment did come from um, from when it's talking about rebu rebuilding the, the, the wall and all that stuff, that all fits as far as when he was cut off. And so, and then the one week in verse 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the, till the consumption and that determined shall be poured upon a desolate. Talking about the abomination and desolation having within the midst of the week. And all the timelines in Daniel and in Revelation all line up to be the fact that there's a three and a half year period, abomination, desolation, and then another three and a half years, approximately, right? And so you have this seven year period. So um, we can definitely mean seven years. I'm not convinced that that's what it's talking about. I used to think that. I'm just going to be honest with you. Just, just from casual reading, that's the way I always kind of read it, was the week was talking about the seven years. But just reading it more carefully, I kind of come to the conclusion that he, he made, he said, you need to stay with, you need to be with Leah for a week, <laughs> okay, before, uh, before you marry Rachel. And so, and then he gives him Rachel and then he works seven years after that. So you didn't have to wait a whole nother seven years for Rachel, okay. Now obviously, was it right for him to marry two people? No, <laughs> okay, let's just be, let's just say that, okay, but, but that's what happened. And so the end of the chapter here is where Leah gives birth to, to the four uh, first patriarchs of, of Israel. Um, and so I just want to read through this because what you'll see here is that when they, when, when they have children, when they give them names, they have meanings to the names. And so if you want to know what these names mean, just look at the passage of when they're born usually. It'll, it'll talk about that. So in Genesis 29 verse 31 it says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said. So notice that's why he's calling him Reuben, because she said this, what? Surely the Lord had looked upon my affliction. So you can see what Reuben is meaning. And I'm not saying I understand exactly, like a, a short phrase of what, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that if you were to say his name, that's what it, like Reuben means, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. And you know the Puritans, this is a funny thing anyway, the Puritans, um, you know the ones, the pilgrims that came over across on the Mayflower and all that stuff, they, they were all about not using words, to, you know, like they would literally, instead of naming someone Reuben, they would say, you know, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Be like, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Come eat. Like they would literally name people like what that name meant. And so it was really strange, okay? The Puritans were the ones when they were, uh, uh, the Gideon Bible, or the, the, the Puritans were the ones that when they were translating the King James Bible, they didn't like the word church. They wanted it to be congregation, like everywhere. Okay, they were against like words like that. Or, you know, they wanted it to be spelled out. They didn't like transliterated words. They wanted stuff to be just set out, what, what it's like. So, that would be ridiculous, <laughs> okay, when you think about the, what these names mean sometimes. So, it says in verse 33, so Reuben was born, 
and it says, uh, it says, and she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. So you can see in there what that's talking about, about being hated and or being, you know, there's probably, not necessarily meaning like, like I was hated, that's why I was named Simeon, but more so like the Lord uh, heard that I was hated. The Lord heard me or something like that. Um, in verse 34 it says, And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. So I don't know if Levi means like joined or something like that. I'm not saying I know the answer, okay? What what the, their names mean? I didn't look it up in Hebrew and look in the Greek concord or the Hebrew concordance. But what I'm saying here is that you can kind of understand why they're called that. Uh, verse 35, and she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, "Now I will praise the Lord." Therefore shall uh, she called his name Judah and left bearing. Remember, actually, we, we haven't got there yet, but uh, Genesis 49, he's going to give a, re, uh, like, a, talk about the end times or the last times dealing with all the patriarchs. And one of the things it says, Judah is the one that, that his brethren shall praise. And who's Jesus, Jesus come out of? He's the line out of the tribe of Judah. And so you can see the praise being uh, established with Judah that 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 name Judah has a lot to do with being praised or praising the Lord. Okay. And so anyway, when, when you read through that type of stuff, don't just read over and just think there's nothing to it. Um, it'll kind of tell you about the person a little bit or tell you about why they were named that. Um, and so you'll see that with the other, with the other children uh, as far as when they're born. Uh, also, you know, uh, try to remember the patriarch's names in order if you can. And Mike Malutich actually gave me a way to remember, a way to remember whose handmaid was who. Okay, so you had Zilpah, right? And uh, uh, I'm blanking out now, uh, Bilha. And so you have these two handmaids, and how do you remember which one's which? Um, let me make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, Zilpah. Yeah, Zilpah and Bilha, right? So Mike told me, he's like, the way I remember it is R&B, like R&B music, and lazy, like being lazy. And so, uh, and so I always remember that. It's just a simple way. You know when I memorize stuff or I'm trying to remember things for tests and stuff like that, I think of stupid things like that to like try to remember it. And it's really dumb, but it, you remember it. So what's Leah, Leah's handmaid is what? Zilpa, because lazy, right? And then you think of... Uh, uh, R&B, you know, like R&B music. I'm not saying to listen to R&B music, but you think of R&B, so Rachel and Bilha. Okay? That one's free. <laughs> anyway, it may not work out for you as far as memorizing that, but uh, anyway, when you get into the patriarchs, when you're trying to remember who's born from who, you're going to need to remember the, the handmaidens because each handmaiden is going to bear two sons. And so, you know, try to remember who's who bear who and stuff like that. Um, you know, just simple Bible knowledge type stuff uh, is always good to have. So let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today and thank you for this passage. And, and Lord, just a lot of good things that we can see in here, uh, things to learn from, things to do, things not to do. And Lord, there's always good information and just little keys to understand uh, other passages in the Bible. And Lord, I just pray that you be with us as we go back to work. I pray that you to help us to bring glory to your name. I pray for soul winning opportunities. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's